Thanks for coming. Uh, it's really an honor to be here and to see so many people turn out for uh, this. Um, I, uh, before I start, I just wanted to mention that um, I'm going to be showing images up here. Uh, there's some uh, kind of brutal images, um, and I'm going to be reading a little bit from the book, and there's a lot of cursing. Uh, that's how people talk in prison, so it's hard to avoid that. Um, so, in uh, 2014, December 2014, I uh, applied for a job as a corrections officer uh, at, uh, with Corrections Corporation of America. Um, I filled out an application online. Uh, I did it, filled it out truthfully, uh, used my real name, uh, my current employer, um, and I had been, been reporting on prisons for uh, a few years at that point. Um, and like anybody who reports on prisons was constantly frustrated with how difficult it was to get inside prisons uh, in the U.S. And even to get access to basic information. Um, uh, we have, you know, every state has laws about access to public records. And uh, in many states, uh, even to, to get departments of corrections to comply with those laws, you have to sue them. Um, and with private prisons, uh, it's much more difficult to get information. Um, these are, you know, private companies, they're not uh, public institutions, so often public records laws don't, uh, you know, uh, don't uh, count, they don't take effect. Um, and, but more importantly, since these companies had started in the 80s, we hadn't had a kind of up-close look of the day-to-day -day life inside of these prisons, so I wanted to figure out how to get inside. Um, I applied for a job. I didn't think it was going to work, honestly, but it just took me an hour or two of my time. But within a couple of weeks after filling the application, I was getting phone calls uh, from Corrections Corporation of America prisons around the country, uh, and I was doing job interviews. Um, and these interviews, you know, they weren't asking me why I wanted to work in the prison. They didn't ask me anything about my job history. I had no indication they even read my application. Um, and... Uh, they were, it was like they were trying to kind of sell me the job. Um, you know, the, the job uh, in Louisiana uh, was $9 an hour. Um, so you can imagine they're talking to somebody who lives in California. Uh, th there's not a lot of reason that somebody would move across the country for a $9 an hour job to work in a prison. Uh, you know, so they're, they're kind of trying to sell me uh, on the job. And, um, and the, the interviews were kind of generic, like, could have been a Walmart interview, like, uh, how do you work with others, uh, you know, if your boss tells you to do something you don't want to do, how do you respond, that kind of thing. Um, and this company that I uh, applied for, the Corrections Corporation of America, it's a $1.8 billion company. Um, the private prison industry is a $4 billion a year industry. Uh, about 8% of the prison population is held in these uh, prisons and uh, two-thirds of uh, the immigrant detention um, population of, are held in uh, prisons or detention centers um, run by private companies. So I moved to Winfield, Louisiana. Um, it's a town of uh, 5,000 people. The uh, average household income is $25,000 a year. Uh, the last sheriff before I was there was locked up for dealing meth. Um, Wynn is uh, the oldest medium security private prison in the country. Uh, it has about 1,500 inmates and uh, it's in the middle of a national forest. And uh, Wynn's, the contract that it had with the state of Louisiana guaranteed that uh, the, it that the prison would be kept 96% uh, occupancy, occupancy uh, at minimum. So the state uh, was required to send uh, prisoners uh, to the prison, uh, and if it didn't, you know, it would pay the company um, as though it was 96% full. Uh, the way the company makes money is the state pays them a daily rate per prisoner. In Louisiana, it was $34 per inmate per day. In California, it's around 80. It depends on the state. Um, and the company's also traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So I spent uh, four months total in the prison. Um, I went through a month of training and worked there for three months. Uh, I had a, this watch uh, that I bought for like $35 on the internet that has a camera. 
Um, so I wore this in the prison and was able to take video. Uh, I also had this pen which recorded audio. Um, and the pen I would leave uh, running at all times. So later, you know, when I would go back and listen to the recordings and, you know, I couldn't obviously be taking notes uh, the entire time I was there. I would run into the bathroom when I could and jot down kind of important things. But um, I wanted to, you know, not to have to rely on my memory later. Um, I wanted that what I wrote to be verbatim uh, dialogue. So in the book, everything between quotation marks is, uh, is exactly what people said. Um, so I went through, uh, like I said, a month of training, and uh, we were told in the job that part of our, our job as, as prison guards was to uh, deliver value to our shareholders. Um, oftentimes that meant that we were uh, kind of meant to do the, the minimum uh, required of us to protect the company from lawsuits uh, and also protect the liability. Um, so I'm going to read a little section here that kind of touches on that. This was um, from my second day of, of training. Mr. Tucker asked what we should do if we see two inmates stabbing each other. I'd probably call somebody, a cadet offers. I'd sit there and holler, stop, says a veteran guard. Mr. Tucker points at her. Damn right, that's it. If they don't pay attention to you, hey, there ain't nothing else you can do. He cups his hand around his mouth. Stop fighting, he says to some visible prisoners. I said stop fighting. His voice is nonchalant. Y'all ain't gonna stop, huh? He makes like he's back out of a, backing out of a door and slams it shut. Leave your ass in there, he turns to face us. Somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna lose. Hell, they both might lose, but hey, did you do your job? Hell yeah. The classroom erupts in laughter. We could try to break up a fight if we wanted to, he says, but he wouldn't recommend it. We are not going to pay you that much, he says emphatically. The next raise you get is not going to be much more than the one you got last time. The only thing that's important to us is that we go home at the end of the day, period. So if them fools want to cut each other, well, happy cutting. The Corrections Corporation was founded in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, but uh, it was not the first company uh, to run a prison. Um, for most of America's history, uh, prisons were meant to turn a profit, uh, either for private companies or directly uh, for the state, especially in the South. Um, so when, after I did this undercover project, I spent four months in the prison, uh, I then uh, wrote a long article for Mother Jones Magazine. And when I went to, to write this book, um, I realized and decided that I, if I was going to really tell the story of, of for-profit prisons in the U.S., I had to go way back. Um, and so I went all the way back to the American Revolution. And uh, the way that I, I write the book is uh, it's kind of set up in alternating chapters where um, I go you know, into the undercover experience and then... Uh, trace the evolution of for-profit prisons from the American Revolution through slavery all the way up to the present. Um, one of the, the kind of uh, big demands of the American Revolution was uh, to change the criminal justice system and the mode of punishment by the British that was seen as, you know, really brutal. Um, people would be hanged, executed for theft, robbery. This was kind of the norm of the time. And... Uh, after the revolution, Thomas Jefferson proposed what he called uh, penal slavery, which was uh, where prisoners would uh, be forced to labor for the state. Um, they would work on public roads and uh, just kind of public works in general. And uh, the idea was that uh, prisoners would be... Uh, one, one of the things was that the, the kind of Protestant elites at the time thought that uh, crime was caused by lack of a work ethic, and that if people were made to work, uh, they would be um, reformed. Uh, they would also be shamed by having to work in public. Uh, this, this kind of uh, type of punishment didn't last very long. It became very unpopular. Um, and uh, one of the co-signatories of the Declaration of Independence, ben Benjamin Rush, uh, was worried that this uh, type of punishment would actually threaten American capitalism. 
uh, he was worried that uh, the, uh, by having people labor in public, that labor itself would be denigrated in the same way that uh, in the South, white people did not want to do the same labor, labor as slaves. So he proposed uh, the creation of a house of repentance uh, where people would be uh, made to labor uh, at a profit to the state, but out of public view. And so in doing that, a new type of institution was created, the penitentiary, um, which was different from jails that had existed throughout civilization. Um, it was uh, seen as a, a reform measure where instead of um, capital punishment, uh, people could be put into the penitentiary for a period of time uh, and, and forced to labor and uh, then released. So the uh, Walnut Street Penitentiary uh, was created in the uh, late, uh, in 1774. Um, and other states kind of copied this model. Uh, the Walnut Street Penitentiary was intended uh, to turn a profit. Um, but within a few years, um, the, w well, within, a, I would say, about 20 years, uh, legislators in various states were starting to say that the penitentiary was a failed experiment. Uh, and they were actually debating uh, whether or not to uh, abolish the penitentiaries. Um, crime was not going down. Uh, they were not generating profits like Rush had promised. Um, and uh, inmates were rioting and burning prisons down. Um, but then in New York, uh, one prison, the Auburn State Penitentiary, uh, attempted uh, to do something new. Uh, in order to try to generate profit, they wanted to lease the labor of prisoners to, uh, to private contractors. But private contractors were reluctant to do this because of this kind of reputation that prisons had at the time of sabotage and uh, factories being burned down. Um, so he convinced the state to uh, reinstitute whipping, which had been banned by the American Revolution. And he said that he was going to uh, turn uh, convicts into silent laboring machines. Uh, so he instituted a regimen where uh, convicts were not allowed to speak to each other. They worked from dawn to dusk. Uh, and anybody caught shirking work uh, would be whipped. And as a result, the Auburn uh, State Penitentiary uh, turned a profit. And uh, also as a result of this, the states, rather than abandoning penitentiaries, uh, followed the Auburn model. And uh, states started taking out loans and building penitentiaries that would be, uh, the loans would be repaid uh, through the use of, of prison labor. Um, and this caused kind of the first prison boom uh, in American history. Um, and it also kind of created the, the first time in world history where, uh, where the main mode of punishment was uh, imprisonment. And uh, imprisonment generally meant uh, in the U.S. Uh, laboring for, for private contractors. So uh, back to Wynn. Um, the other, the kind of cadets that I worked with, uh, that I went through training with, uh, were generally, uh, I would say, not kind of sadists who wanted to work in a prison um, or anybody who kind of dreamed of working in a prison when they grew up. They were generally poor people from the town uh, who felt like they had no other options. Uh, there were a lot of uh, single moms working there who, um, you know, needed health insurance for their kids. There were also a lot of uh, kids just out of high school. Um, one, uh, one person I write about a lot who I call Collinsworth um, had, uh, was just out of high school. The only other job he had was working at Starbucks. Um, so I'm going to read a little section here involving him. People say a lot of negative things about CCA, Ms. Blanchard says. They will hire anybody. They were scraping the bottom of, a barrel, of the barrel. Which is not really true, but if you come here and you're breathing and you've got a valid driver's license and you're willing to work, then we're willing to hire you. She looks at us sternly. You're going to realize that you're not getting paid enough for what you're doing, for what you're putting up with back there, she tells us. Nine dollars is not a lot of money. You can go get that at McDonald's. For $9, all we really attract is a person who doesn't have responsibilities, doesn't have a lot of bills to pay. If I'm a man trying to support my family on $9 an hour, you can't. You've got to pay for gas. She warns us that prisoners are going to remind us every day of how little we make. And then your eyes open up to it. Your mind opens up to it. Then they start to ask you to do things for them because they have, a, they have more money than what you're making in a day. And that's appealing to a lot of people. 
By late morning, our instructors haven't shown. So Ms. Blanchard tells, tells us we can go to the gym to watch inmates graduate from trade class, where they learn skills like carpentry and plumbing. Prisoners and their families are milling around the basketball court with plates of cake and cups of fruit punch. An inmate offers a piece of red velvet to Miss Sterling. People are smiling, laughing. When you see an inmate with a smile like that, it's worth something, the wind coach says to a prisoner who is standing with his parents. I feel surprisingly at ease wandering among prisoners in my uniform. Keep your head up, an older black man in a wheelchair says to me. His legs are stumps. I always know who you is. I'm not talking about coming out of the suit. I'm talking about being in the suit. Everything's going to be all right. He tells me his name is Robert Scott, and he's been, there, been here for 12 years. I was walking when I got here, he tells me. Had all my fingers. I notice he's wearing fingerless gloves with nothing poking out of them. They took my legs in January and my fingers in June. Gangrene don't play. I kept going to the infirmary saying, my feet hurt, my feet hurt. They said, ain't nothing wrong with you. I don't see nothing wrong with you. He tells me he's suing CCA for neglect, claiming the inmates are denied medical care because the company operates the prison on a skeleton crew for profitable gain. Prisoners continue to mill around. Collinsworth suggested that we order everyone to get on the bleachers. No, nah, man, Willis says, looking across the gym. There's only seven of us. We can't take all of them motherfuckers right there. Eventually, they sit down and the gym grows silent. The inmates stare at us from across the room. The tension ratchets up until an inmate lets out a blood-curdling scream. The other prisoners laugh. The coach orders all of them to form a line in front of us. We will call them, he will call them to the bathroom one by one to be strip-searched before going back to their units. I brace myself as the inmates stride toward us. Several gather around me and Collinsworth to ask about our watches. Some get, get up close to mine, looking directly into the camera. One, wearing a cocked gray beanie, asks to buy them. I refuse outright. Collinsworth dithers. How old you is, the, man asks him, the inmate asks him. You never know, Collinsworth says. Man, all these fake-ass signals, the best thing you could do to get, is get to know people in this place. I understand it's your home, Collinsworth says, but I'm at work right now. It's your home for 12 hours a day, you tripping. You're about to do half that time with me. You straight with that? It's probably true. It ain't no probably true. If you're going to be in this bitch, you're going to do 12 hours a day. He tells Collinsworth not to bother writing people up for small infractions. They're not paying you enough for that. Seeming torn between whether to impress me or the inmate, Collinsworth says he will only write up serious offenses, like hiding drugs. Drugs? Don't worry about the drugs. The inmate says the guards turn a blind eye to it. They ain't tripping on that shit, he says. I'm telling you, it ain't that type of camp. You can't come, to, come and change things by yourself. You might as well go with the flow. Get this free-ass, easy-ass money and go home. There's a pause. This job, you'll see, it's got benefits. Oh yeah, I got some benefits already, Collinsworth says, like health insurance. I'm not talking about no health insurance. I'm talking about some more money. I'm just here to do my job and take care of my family, Collinsworth says. I'm not going to bring stuff in, because even if I did, didn't get caught, there's always a chance that I will. Nah, ain't no chance. I ain't never heard of nobody moving good and low-key getting caught. Nah. I know a dude's still rolling. He's been doing it six years. He looks at Collinsworth. Easy. An inmate picks the podium over his head and runs with it across the gym. Another throws his graduation certificate dramatically into the trash. The coach shouts, exasperated, as prisoners continue to scramble around. I can't breathe, one shouts. You see this chaos, the inmate in the beanie says to Collinsworth. If you'd been to other camps, you'd see the order they got. Ain't no order here. Inmates run this bitch, son. So in the south, uh, after this kind of prison boom happened in the north, uh, the south was actually really uh, reluctant to build penitentiaries. Uh, one of the reasons is that penitentiaries were associated with uh, abolitionists, slavery abolitionists because abolitionists tended to be uh, uh, also uh, against the capital punishment, and they saw the penitentiary system as a reform. And even though people were forced to labor, uh, they reasoned that it was uh, not for a lifetime uh, necessarily, so it was, it was uh, an improvement. Um, and the penitentiary system also challenged the southern uh, kind of ideology of white supremacy because uh, 
the people who would be going to the penitentiaries uh, would mostly be white um, because uh, African Americans were mostly uh, enslaved in the South and were, uh, were punished on, the pen on their uh, plantations. And uh, so white people would be uh, made to do forced labor and uh, so they would be kind of making uh, white people, putting them uh, at the same level as, as uh, enslaved people. Um, and in Louisiana, the, the legislator was, was ultimately convinced to build a penitentiary because uh, when, when they found out that uh, the penitentiary of the North were, were bringing a profit to the state and adding money to the state coffers. And rather than kind of challenge the idea of, of white supremacy, it ended up supporting it. Uh, even though the prisoners uh, were mostly white, they were uh, in the Louisiana State Penitentiary, they were, um, it was like the other the prisons in the North, uh, essentially a factory, and they were producing uh, clothes and shoes uh, for slaves. Uh, and they were sold to planters at a discount to kind of undercut the Northern uh, manufacturing market. Um, and the, uh, the Louisiana State Penitentiary, which, which was opened up uh, in uh, 1835, was uh, written up in newspapers uh, in the South. Uh, there was a, an op-ed in South Carolina that suggested that uh, slave owners um, learned from the penitentiary system. Um, it was kind of on the cutting edge of forced labor at the time because it was industrial. And uh, it suggested that um, Slave owners uh, used women and children uh, to work on cotton mills like they were in the penitentiary rather than be in the fields where they were not as productive as men. Um, when I was doing a lot of this research, you know, I, I often wondered if uh, slavery had not ended when it did, um, if, you know, the slavery would have moved in the direction uh, of the penitentiary system if, as the South became more and more industrial. Um, in, a lot of states kind of followed Louisiana's lead. Um, in Texas, after they, uh, they opened their first penitentiary, it quickly became the state's largest factory. And uh, it was the greatest, the largest supplier of textiles west of the Mississippi. And uh, the, before the penitentiary was opened in Texas, a Texas jailer had said um, that ran just kind of the, the jail where people were held before going to trial. Um, he suggested that they open it to penitentiary as a way to push against the overgrown monopolies of the North. Um, and, you know, to give some, some kind of uh, context to what was happening in Louisiana at the time, um, Louisiana, New Orleans in particular, was uh, on its way to surpassing New York as the country's economic capital. Uh, it had the largest slave market. Uh, had the largest concentration of banks in the country. Um, the frontier was constantly expanding and opening up land for cotton. Um, money was flowing in from the north. Uh, it was very easy to get loans. Um, and in uh, 1837, the bubble burst and the country went through its first Great Depression. And uh, the, the prison was, was no longer bringing money to the state. And to save money, uh, the state did what states do today. Uh, it privatizes its uh, prison. Uh, so in um, uh, 1845 or 1844, the Louisiana State Penitentiary was privatized just nine years after it opened. So this kind of, the, this idea that the prison um, was meant to uh, rehabilitate um, died very fast. Uh, it, I found a, a memoir of a prisoner who was, who was there at the time and he talks about uh, you know, how the kind of, any attempts that existed towards rehabilitation just fell away and the whole, everything was about making profit. Um, and, you know, this, the idea that prisons were uh, rehabilitating people through labor was, there was really no evidence to back it. Uh, it was not tested, but by this point, it kind of really didn't matter. Uh, Louisiana, by uh, 1857 was making the modern day equivalent of $1.2 million a year on his penitentiary, which is about $4,000 per uh, prisoner. Um, back to Wynn. Um, my first day on the job, I was uh, stationed on suicide watch. Um, this is generally kind of the worst job in the prison, so new guards would be uh, put there. Uh, at Wynn, there was one part-time psychiatrist for the entire prison of 1,500 uh, inmates, which was much less than public prisons, which, you know, also had uh, terrible mental health services. 
Um, there's one full-time social worker. So generally, uh, often the only type of mental health service uh, people had was suicide watch, which was essentially being put in solitary confinement. Uh, this is suicide watch cell. Um, the they prisoners would have no clothes, um, no mattress, no nothing to read, and the the they would actually be given worse food. They were given these little bags. They called them suicide bags, like a bag lunch, uh, and the caloric intake of that was uh, lower than USDA recommended, uh, you know, amount of calories for an adult male. Um, the uh, we were told in training that the sparse conditions were meant in part to deter people from going on uh, suicide watch. Sometimes prisoners would go there because they had a trouble with somebody else they need to get out of their dorm. Um, and uh, it costs the company money to run suicide watch because in suicide watch there would be a guard uh, would have to sit and, and watch a prisoner um, all day. So it was one guard to one or two prisoners as opposed to the norm which was uh, one guard to about 175 prisoners. Um, and they told us in training that if somebody was on suicide watch for 48 hours, they would have to get permission from the regional corporate office to, uh, to extend it. Um, the man who's in this picture uh, was one of the first, was the first person I watched. Um, his name is Damien Costley. Uh, he, while I was watching him at one point, he, he, he didn't want me sitting there. Um, you know, I'm sitting there staring at him all day. He tried to get me to leave. At one point, he uh, said that he was going to jump on his bed and jump off and break his neck. So I had to go report it, which I was required to do. And like six hours later, uh, um, a psychiatrist showed up, talked to him through the bars for five minutes. And uh, after I left the prison, after, long after I, you know, was done with his undercover project, um, uh, it had been exposed that I was working there. Uh, I got a, a lawyer got in touch with me and uh, because there, there had been some local media that they found out that I was a reporter and this person had uh, seen that I was there and uh, she asked me if I knew Damien uh, and I said that I had, that I had watched him on Suicide Watch and it turned out that he had committed suicide. Uh, and Damien... Uh, when he, when he died, he weighed 71 pounds. Uh, he had, um, I learned later, I met his mother, I went back to Louisiana, um, I looked through, she allowed me to look through all of his files uh, and medical records, and he had, been, uh, he had been on suicide watch many times, he had also gone on hunger strike, uh, or to back up, he, he was suicidal in part because um, he, he was in prison for, uh, for shooting and killing a man uh, after the man spit on him in some altercation. And uh, he was dealing with a lot of guilt around it. He had told other prisoners that he was considering committing suicide, told the social worker. And he went on hunger strike many times uh, demanding um, better mental health care in the prison. Um, he didn't get it and he committed suicide. Uh, I, I later did a, a public records request to the state of Louisiana um, and asked them how many people that year had committed suicide in the prison, and they told me zero. Now, CCA claims that their uh, rate of suicide is lower than it is in public prisons. So what happened, what I found out was that uh, when um, Damien hanged himself, he, he went into a coma and was uh, sent to a hospital where he was for uh, many days before he died. During that time, the warden uh, granted him a compassionate release. And uh, so when he died, he was not in the prison's custody. So the company was able to keep it off the books. Uh, during the Civil War, the state of Louisiana took the prison back over. Um, it took it back from the private company. Um, and it was using prison labor to manufacture, to do war production. Uh, and so as soon as the war ended, many rich men in the South, um, you know, no longer had uh, people that they were enslaving. And uh, they, many of them schemed, tried to scheme a way to uh, continue slavery. Um, the 13th Amendment had abolished slavery except for punishment uh, of a crime. And so in Louisiana, a man named Samuel Lawrence James thought to himself, you know, uh, before the war, the state was leasing prisoners uh, 
why wouldn't they do it again? Uh, the, state, the economy of Louisiana and the economies of states throughout the South were in ruins after the war, and uh, they needed to save money wherever they could. So Samuel Lawrence James proposed to the state that uh, it, he lease all of the prisoners of the state and be allowed to, to use them as laborers. Uh, the state agreed. He bought a plantation uh, called Angola. It was named after the uh, you know, country that a lot of the slaves had come from that had previously been there. He moved, him and his family moved there, and uh, they put prisoners to work on the field and lived a life identical to uh, the life of slavery, um, of the slavery times. Uh, but mostly he used convicts um, on levees and railroads. He found that uh, it cost a 20th um, of the rate of free laborers um, using, using prisoners. And uh, this, this actually was illegal in Louisiana. Um, he was only allowed to use prisoners within the penitentiary. Uh, and the state tried to stop him. They told him that he couldn't do that. And he just ignored them and kept his labor camps going. And he also uh, was meant to uh, pay the state, you know, a portion of the profits. And this was happening throughout the South. Uh, the businessmen that were leasing prisoners would pay a cut to the state. So the state was also making money. But James did not do that. He just didn't pay the state. And the um, state sued him. Uh, and he just ignored it. And eventually they backed off. Um, he had become one of the most powerful men in the state of Louisiana. Uh, he leased prisoners for, for about 30 years uh, to become untouchable. Um, and, you know, states throughout the South were making tons of money off this system. Um, the U.S. Commissioner of Labor reported that uh, uh, states using convict leasing uh, were making four times the cost of running a prison. Uh, Alabama, at one point, was making 10 percent of its state revenue from, uh, from convict leasing. Um, in all the research, historical research I did, the thing that really shocked me the most was uh, learning that convict leasing was, was more deadly than slavery. And it was uh, on par with the death rate of the Soviet gulags. Uh, the average annual death rate throughout the South was uh, 16 to 25 percent of prisoners dying every year. Um, in some, some places, it was as high as 40%. Um, in, you know, in, in Louisiana, about in, during the, the reign of, of Samuel Lawrence James, the 30-year uh, period that he, had, he was uh, leasing, uh, about 3,000 prisoners died. Um, in slavery times, you know, there was very few slave owners that had more than 1,000 slaves, and there's no record of any letting that many uh, enslaved people die. And the... The difference between the system and uh, the system of slavery before the Civil War, I think, was summed up really uh, well uh, by this Southern man who um, he told the National Conference of Charities and Corrections in 1883. He said, before the war, we owned the Negroes. If a man had a good Negro, he could afford to take care of him. If he was sick, get a doctor. He might even put gold plugs in his teeth. But these convicts, we don't own them. One dies, get another. So these, you know, the prisoners were not, slave owners kind of saw their slaves as uh, their property and as investments, and with the, um, the lessees, they were essentially just uh, leasing a number. And if somebody died, they would just send him another one. Back to Wynn. You know, I took the job as a guard as really as a way to get inside the prison and see what was happening in the prison. Um, I knew that I would write about being a guard, but it was not my, that wasn't kind of the fo my focus. Um, I wanted to kind of see what conditions were like inside. And I thought, you know, I would go in, be kind of an easygoing guard, uh, stay out of people's way, and I wouldn't have much trouble. Um, but it wasn't like that. Uh, I saw myself changing very quickly um, and uh, kind of becoming more and more authoritarian. Uh, it was very difficult to do the job. Um, you know, I was in a unit with uh, 350 prisoners, and there, on the floor there was one other guard, a man who was in his 60s. Um, and it was literally impossible to do the things that we were supposed to do. Um, and, you know, I, I quickly got kind of wrapped up in uh, kind of 
complicated web of power that exists in a prison and petty battles with prisoners. Um, and th this prison, uh, you know, for 1,500 inmates, there was 24, 25 guards in the prison at one time. You know, so this is one of the ways the, the company makes money. Uh, the staffing is kind of the main expense of running a prison. So uh, they paid the guards low and, you know, had kept staff low. Um, and, you know, I would go home at the end of the day, and the longer I was there, the kind of more ashamed I felt after going home of the person I was inside, and I felt that the, these kind of two people were becoming more and more different. Um, so I'm going to read one more scene here. Um, this is after I'd been on the job for a few weeks. I was trying to figure out what this balance, you know, between being uh, firm and, you know, uh, just humane. Um, and for, for some context, I had had a conflict a little a while, uh, a couple days before I really blew up on a prisoner for the first time uh, and just kind of snapped and shouted at him. And then kind of reconciled with him. Um, his, he, I call him in the book Pink Shades. My reconciliation with Pink Shades encouraged me. Every time I have a problem with a prisoner... I try the same approach, and eventually we tap knuckles to show each other respect. Still, these breakthroughs are fleeting. In the moment, they feel like a glimmer of a possibility that we can appreciate each other's humanity. But I come to understand that our positions make this virtually impossible. We can chat and laugh through the bars, but inevitably, I need to flex my authority. My job will always be to deny them the most basic of human impulses, to push for more freedom. Day by day, the number of inmates who are friendly with me grows smaller. There are exceptions, like Corner Store, but were I to take away the privileges Bakel and I have granted him, I know that he, too, would become an enemy. My priorities change. Striving to treat everyone as human takes too much energy. More and more, I focus on proving I won't back down. I am vigilant. I come to work ready for people to catcall me or run up on me and threaten to punch me in the face. I show neither fear nor compunction. Sometimes prisoners call me racist, and it stings, but I try as hard as I can not to flinch, because to do so would be to show a pressure point, a button that can be pressed when they, need, when they want to make me bend. Nearly every day the unit reaches a crescendo of frustration, because inmates are supposed to be going somewhere like the law library, GED classes, vocational training, or a substance abuse group, but their programs are canceled or they are let out of the unit late. Inmates tell me that at other prisons, the schedule is firm. That door would be open and everybody would be on the move, an inmate who's been incarcerated throughout the state says. Here there is no schedule. We wait for the call over the radio, then we let the inmates go. They could eat at 11.30, 11.30 a.m., they could eat at 3 p.m. School might happen, or maybe not. It's been years since Wynn had the staff to run the big yard. Sometimes we let the inmates into the small yard attached to the unit. Often we don't. Canteen and law library hours are canceled regularly. There just aren't enough officers to keep everything going. Guards bond with prisoners over their frustrations. Prisoners tell us they understand we are powerless to change these high-level management problems. Yet the two groups remain locked in a battle like soldiers in a war they don't believe in. Whenever I open a tier door, I demand that everyone show me his pass, and I use my body to stop the flood of people from pouring out. Some just push through. I catch one. Get back in, I shout. I'm writing you up right now if you don't get back in there, you hear me? He walks back in, staring me down. White dude all on my trail, man, he says. I shut the door, ignoring him. You better get the f from down here before I end up hurting one of y'all, he shouts at me. You green as a mother f I'm tired. An inmate comes around the control room. Bakel is following him and calls for me to stop him. I stand in the inmate's path. I know him the one with the mini dreadlocks. I feel threatened, frankly, whenever I see him. This way, I say, pointing back to where he came from. He tries to walk past me. I lock eyes with him. This way, I command. He turns back and walks slowly away. I walk behind him. He stops, spins around, throws his hands in the air, and shouts, the fuck off my trail, dog. I know he's testing me. I open his tear door. He walks in, stands just inside and stares me down hard. I grab the door and slam it shut, bang, in his face. I turn and step back into the throng of inmates milling around the floor. Motherfucker's going to end up dead, he shouts after me. I stop and turn around. 
He just stares. I grab the radio on my shoulder and then pause. Was I ever taught what to do when something like this happens? I know how to press the button and speak into the radio, but whom do I call? I think of King, the officer who'd smashed the kid's jaw. Sergeant King, could you come down to Ash, I say into my shoulder, and route. When he arrives, I take him to B1 tier. I find many dreads. He needs to get locked up, I say, looking him in the eyes. King cuffs him. I tell him the inmate threatened my life. He needs to go to SEG. What happened? I ain't said nothing, the inmate shouts. I walk away. I go back to chasing the others into their tears. What'd you lock that dude up for, an inmate asks me. Dude was about to go home, another says. He ain't gonna go home now. I walk away, unyielding. In the back of my mind, however, there is a voice. Did you see him say anything? Wasn't your back turned? Are you sure what you heard? It doesn't matter, really. He wanted to intimidate me, and it was about time I threw someone in the hole. They need to know I'm not weak. Towards the, um, the end of the 20th century into the 1910s and 1920s, uh, states in various ways kind of became jealous of the uh, profits that private companies were making. And at this time, uh, these were not just uh, planters, they were major corporations like the U.S. Steel Company, uh, the first billion dollar company in the world. Um, they were using thousands of convicts as slave labor. And so the states started to cut out the middleman and they start buying plantations of their own uh, or coal mines. Uh, and uh, they would uh, put the prisoners to work on the plantations and uh, take all the money you know, themselves and put it directly into their treasuries. Um, and this, this really went on for, for decades. Um, and, you know, to keep the costs low and maximize profits, a lot of states like Louisiana on the Angola plantation uh, that Samuel Lawrence James had bought, the state bought that plantation and it uh, gave guns to the prisoners, uh, to certain prisoners, um, typically the most brutal prisoners, and uh, used them as guards. Um, so rather than hiring guards, they would... Uh, used prisoners, and in uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas, uh, inmate guards who shot and killed uh, prisoners attempting to escape would be granted an uh, automatic parole. Uh, prisoners were used as, uh, as overseers. Um, they would uh, whip other prisoners who weren't meet meeting cotton quotas. Um, Arkansas until, uh, allowed whipping until 1967. Um, it was also uh, electrocuting uh, prisoners that uh, weren't meeting quotas. And uh, this was, uh, I was, you know, going through a lot of the kind of old penitentiary reports. This was 1965. This is a penitentiary report from Texas, uh, just detailing how much the state's making from cotton. Um, and this is the world that uh, Terrell Don Hutto, co-founder of the Corrections Corporation of America, started his career was in this world. He, uh, he uh, was a warden in 1967 of a plantation prison in Texas called Ramsey that was the size of Manhattan. This is, this is uh, the prison. Um, he lived on the plantation with his family. He had uh, what they were calling houseboys. Uh, these were prisoners, almost always black, who served him and his family. Um, unpaid, of course. Uh, and I found some of the regulations that the state had around the use of, of houseboys by wardens, and they kind of echoed the, the fears that slave owners had of their uh, house slaves. Um, his, Hutto's wife, for example, was not um, allowed to be overly familiar with them. Uh, they would do the family's laundry, but they were not allowed to wash her underwear. Um, they were not allowed to sit with the family um, uh, and, you know, have normal conversation for, with them for fear they would lead to impertinence. Hutto uh, did so, so, such a good job at Ramsey that he was hired by the state of Arkansas to run their entire prison system, uh, which consisted of two plantations. Uh, so he went there in 1971, um, and he started a, a prison rodeo where prisoner, or the public would buy tickets and uh, uh, prisoners would... Um, play, do these uh, rodeo games like um, trying to get a, pull a poker chip off of a bull's forehead uh, for a cash prize. Prisoners were getting gored. Um, 
and Hato uh, ran that system. He it had kind of gone into the red, and he brought it back and ran it at a, at a profit. And he was really the last person uh, to run a public prison at a profit. Um, after he, uh, when he left Arkansas, the prison population in the United States just skyrocketed. And um, as a result of that, and also as a result of some lawsuits, the prison labor, uh, the prison situation in the South changed a lot. Um, there are still a lot of prisons that are run as plantations, but they're not run a profit. Uh, prisoners are generally um, not all forced to work. They're not working from dawn till dusk. They're not being uh, tortured for, you know, not meeting uh, labor conditions. And by the way, a, a federal judge had uh, condemned Hutto for uh, for using torture. Like prisoners who uh, refused to work, who would be put in solitary confinement naked. Um, so prisons went from this kind of labor camp situation to being kind of human warehouses, kind of what they are today. Um, and so just a handful of years after Hutto left the Arkansas system, which he was running at a profit, uh, a couple of businessmen approached him. Uh, he had been known for uh, running prisons at, as a business uh, for the state, and they proposed this idea um, of creating the Corrections Corporation of America. Um, towards the end of my time at Wynn, uh, the prison became really chaotic. Uh, there was, it was the most violent prison in Louisiana. Um, it was, uh, in a four-month period, there were about 200 weapons found. This was uh, 23 times more than Angola prison, which is now the state's maximum security prison. Um, uh, everybody, the, the, the state sent people in, the company sent in their, these guys. They're the special operations uh, response team. They're kind of a SWAT-like uh, team to try to bring the prison in order. Um, they didn't, you know, uh, the way they were dealing with the problem is kind of bringing these guys in to crack down rather than, you know, providing uh, some of the services that prisoners wanted um, or raising pay of staff and that kind of stuff. Um, everyone really, like, in the prison, one of the things that really surprised me about it is that across the board, people despise the company. Guards and prisoners would kind of bond over this. Um, and... Uh, after I left, um, I wrote the article. Um, a few weeks later, uh, the Obama administration announced that they were um, going to stop using private prisons. And the day that he made that announcement, this is what happened to the company's stock price. It dropped by half. Um, when uh, Trump was, uh, won the election, the day that he won, uh, the chart looked like the opposite of that. Um, it rose more than any company in the stock market that day. Um, and right after he was inaugurated, uh, his Justice Department, you know, reversed the Obama era decision. The company is now doing better than it was, uh, you know, before Obama's decision. Um, but when, it, when I was in the prison, uh, I had a, my main work partner, his name is Dave Bakel. Uh, he was constantly frustrated. He was always blowing up. And he, one day he said to me, uh, I wish an investigative reporter would come and uh, investigate the prison. <laughs> so after I, I left, um, I left and I, I went back to Louisiana and met him, and this is what he said. What's up with Bauer? You ain't heard? And I go, no. Uh-uh. He's all over Facebook. He's an undercover reporter. <laughs> I mean, I was, oh, that was so, I was so funny. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the microphone, if you have a question, keep it brief and keep it in the form of a question, and Shane will answer it for you. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a lot of questions. I could talk to you for hours, but I'll make it brief. Uh, I have a question about selection process. Mm -hmm. Who went there? How long did they stay? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, how did you deal with the authority figures as a hidden, you know, uh, reporter? What was it like for you to mm -hmm. do with all that? Yeah. It was only four months, but still. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was a medium security prison. Uh, 
so it was a range of people that were there for too many DUIs to uh, people who had been convicted of murder who had been in higher security prisons but worked them way, their way down to the system through good behavior. So it was kind of a, a broad mix. Um, some people were there for selling drugs, uh, um, rape, you know, these kind of uh, charges. Uh, but the, I don't know of any particular reason they would be sent to that prison versus another one. Um, you know, it was still a state prison. Even though it was privately run, it was still, you know, on the same level as, as the other prisons in the state. Um, uh, as far as how I dealt with, your, so you're asking, as un, being undercover, how did I not expose myself? Uh, so a, a ground rule that I had from the beginning was that I would never lie. Um, but I would not necessarily, you know, need to offer information about myself. So I wasn't going around saying I was a journalist, obviously. Uh, but, you know, if somebody had said, hey, are you, are you Shane Bauer, are you a journalist? Then I would have said yes. Um, but, you know, generally I kind of just uh, didn't say too much, you know, kind of hung back. Uh, and I, you know, I'm from Oakland, California, but, or I live there now, but I'm, I'm from rural Minnesota, you know, I'm not from the South, but I, that world of kind of rural America is not foreign to me. Um, so I could kind of like lean on that, um, you know, aspect of my personality. Um, but, you know, I think that world in the kind of macho culture, rural America, men kind of don't say a lot. So I could just kind of just be stoic and, you know, not really say much. And But sometimes I would... Little things would kind of uh, raise flags that I wouldn't think of. Like, I would, uh, when I was in training, I would bring a sandwich to lunch, and a lot of the other cadets would bring like pizza pockets or chips and dip. And I had a sandwich one day, and this other cadet, was, I had tomatoes on it, and she was like, "Oh, fancy, you know, tomato." <laughs> um, but mostly, you know, the thing is like. Nobody is proud of working there, and I think uh, nobody is prized too hard. So if somebody would, like, one time I kind of was feeling a little comfortable, and I talked about, like, going on a backpacking trip in California, and, and somebody, one of the people at the training was like, why are you here? And I, I was just like, you never know where life's going to take you, and, you know, that's kind of it, and they wouldn't, like, push further, so. Yeah. I'm a little familiar with Walla Walla because my mother's uncle was warden there, and I'm familiar a little bit with Shawshank because I used to staff the corrections committee of the Maine State Legislature. And we would do field trips to different prisons there. And the warden would come to the meetings. So I wonder if other states have state legislature oversight of the prisons in their states. Yeah, they do. And this is the thing, you know, okay, first of all, I guess I haven't said this, but... Um, you know, I focused on my undercover thing was in a private prison. This doesn't mean that I think state prisons are, like, great by any means. Um, prison conditions are dismal across the United States, and there are certain issues that are particular to private prisons, but uh, a lot of the things that I write about in the book, you know, could have happened in a, in a publicly run prison. The other thing is uh, the states are ultimately responsible for all of this stuff. They, the, you know, the states oversee these, these prisons. They are state prisons. So sometimes, you know, it's like the blame all gets kind of put on the, the company. I mean, it's also the companies are running them. Of course, they're responsible, but it's not as if the states are innocent in this. Um, you know, they, they're still their prisons. They're outsourcing. Um, so they're, they're supposed to oversee the prisons, but usually they don't really. I think it varies state to state. I think some states actually have state representatives in the prison, but at Wynn it was not like that. Um, the, it did get so chaotic and violent that the state threatened to pull the contract at one point, and they did take over the prison for a week while I was there. Uh, but then they left, and it just kind of went back to how it was. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just wondering if you've spoken with any activist investors for uh, mm -hmm. CCA. Yeah, I did. Um, I actually went to, uh, I bought a share myself uh, and went to a shareholder meeting. Um, you know, long after I had been undercover. Uh, so after I was at the prison, I tried to, um, you know, I reached out to the company quite a bit. I wanted to interview them. Uh, none of the corporate executives would speak to me. And even the company spokesperson, I never spoke to. It was strictly by email. He would not speak to me. So um, I actually um, contacted Hutto. He's still alive, the co-founder who ran the plantation. Um, told him, 
I emailed him and said, you know, I'm writing a lot about your life before CCA and your career before that. I'd like to meet you. And he wrote me back the same day and was like, sure, happy to. And I told him who I was, like, you know, I'm the guy who wrote that article about Wynn. I'm sure you know me. And, uh, and I bought a plane ticket, um, and then he backed out to the last minute and would not respond to my emails anymore. So I bought a share. Uh, I went to Nashville um, about a year ago, and uh, there were... Um, the thing is, the company, the shares are mostly uh, owned by either a small percentage is by the board members, also mostly by banks and mutual funds. There's not many, like, individual investors. Um, so the, the, the shareholder meeting was, it was almost all the board, which, by the way, some of the people on the board, Thurgood Marshall Jr. is on the board of, of CCA. Uh, he gets, like, $120,000 a year for being on the board. Um, uh, but most of the people there were members of the board, but there were a couple of activist shareholders, um, one named Alex Friedman, who has been pretty dogged. Uh, so the reason I went was because, you know, shareholders get to ask a question. So it was my chance to kind of, you know, talk to them or ask them a question. The CEO was there, Damon Heininger, all these people who I knew who they were but had never met them. You know, I asked a question. I cited a bunch of studies. I talked about what I'd seen at Wynn, and, um, you know, he just gave me this kind of corporate gloss answer about how happy the states are with their work and stuff like that. Um, but investors hold a 10% stake, or is it institutionally held? No, no. 90%? No 10% stake. There's, Alex Freeman had, there was some kind of, most of them were one share, but he had a, a certain number that allowed him to, like, uh, I think make proposals or something like that. But it wasn't, no, it wasn't the kind of activist shareholders that can actually, like, steer the, nobody owns enough to steer the course of the company, anything like that. Um, so she asked uh, about prisoners being uh, paid a dollar an hour for their labor. Um, you were asking specifically in the geo prisons? Yeah. Well, this is also, this is not limited to private prisons. And a dollar an hour, frankly, is much higher than most prisoners make. Uh, generally, it's like, you know, 10 cents. Some states, it's nothing. Um, in California, inmate firefighters make a um, dollar an hour. Uh, I mean, there was just a huge hunger strike, or sorry, a, a prison strike um, across the country uh, where prisoners were um, demanding uh, what they called an end to um, prison slavery, and there was a list of a bunch of demands, uh, but labor was a big one. Um, they were demanding to be paid a, a living wage. Um, you know, there's... Well, the... The labor issue, this is across the prison system. This is public and private, um, you know, and really prisoner labor uh, with, prisoners are essential to kind of running prisons. Without prison labor, the prisons cannot function. I mean, the prison I was at, they're, uh, they're janitors, um, they're cooking, they're doing the laundry. Um, in some prisons, they're making, you know, uh, goods, um, you know. Prisoners are pushing from the inside. There's definitely activists outside working on it. Um, but I haven't seen any major changes yet. Yeah. But it's also state ownership. It's both. I mean, they're, I think, pretty unwilling to change it because uh, they're, you know, if they were paying... I think their rationale is if they're paying prisoners, you know, living wage, then prisons are going to cost a lot more money to run. And, you know, unlike most of American history where prisons were making money, including state prisons, now they cost tons of money. So, uh, you know, states are trying to also save money where they can. Now, I'm just curious if there's any kind of NDA, like non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. They seem like a pretty big target. Yeah. I did not sign a non-disclosure agreement. Has that no. changed? I, I'm assuming from the reporting, so has that changed? Uh, I'm not sure, but I do know that the prison I was in, after I left, I left very suddenly, um, and I won't, I guess I won't say exactly what happened to not spoil it, but uh, 
Um, I left quickly and fled the state to Texas, weirdly. It was like the place, the closest place to flee to. Um, and I did talk to people there after, um, and they said that um, they sent an investigator from the corporate office to kind of dig up whatever they could on me. Um, and they also got the guards all to do fresh background checks. Uh, I don't know if they signed NDAs, but there was this kind of, in that prison, there was an effort to kind of see what was happening, but. What's that? Oh, yeah. The story is in the book. All of these stories are in the book. <laughs> uh, hi, Shane. I'm here with the Human Rights Defense Center. So right. is it okay if I clarify about the shareholder activism? Yeah, yeah. So Alex Friedman is actually with the human... Alex Friedman is actually with the Human Rights Defense Center slash Prison Legal News, and we have an active campaign right now to try to expand his shareholder activism against CCA, which has rebranded itself as Core Civic. So if you're interested, check out that project because we are making some moves about it. Thanks. Uh, the other thing that I came up here to ask mm -hmm. was, uh, you talked about in the beginning a little bit about how private prisons, unfortunately, are not beholden to public records. Can you talk at all about any changes that might be coming up on that? Because that seems pretty irresponsible to have these private companies that are just allowed to run freely without a lot of oversight. Yeah. Uh, I do know that there have been uh, attempts. I don't know the current status, but I know that Alex was at one point a part of um, push, and actually at the shareholder meeting, that is something they raised. Um, you know, that they were pressuring the company to kind of stop uh, trying to lobbying to, to block these uh, these bills. Um, I don't. What's the name of the? Do you know the name of the, the bill? The private prison bill that's coming. Right. Up? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I know there was an effort before, uh, in the past that was um, shot down, and the and core civic lobbied pretty hard against it. Um, but the idea is that you know private prisons should be subject to the same uh, public records rules as, as public prisons. But I don't, I, I don't actually know the current status. Maybe it know, comes but. up every single session, and every yeah. single session, GO, which is another private prison group, and CCA just lobby hard against yeah. it. So yeah. I wasn't sure if you knew of any. I don't know the current changes. status now, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. What were shakedowns like for you? <sighs> Man, uh, okay, there's different types of shakedowns. Um, so when we're in training, they would often bring us in, the trainees to do shakedowns, just because they were so understaffed and they would kind of use us to do this. So. The, the way this prison was set up was people weren't in cells. They were in dorms of like 44 guys to a dorm. So each guy would have a bed and a locker. Um, so we would go in uh, and uh, prisoners would all be put in the TV room and then they would be brought out one by one and we'd have to strip search each of them. Um, so they, and it was just, it was so kind of routine and formulaic. Uh, it was really bizarre. Um, and disturbing, especially the first time I did it. Um, and then we basically go through all their stuff, you know, have to search their lockers. Um, the first time I did it, uh, this was, you know, I, I didn't really talk about this, but, you know, I, I'd been a prisoner for two years um, in Iran, and uh, I remember when I would leave my cell to go outside and come back, and it was all tore up, and that's, like, the worst feeling. Um, so I would go through their lockers and then put everything back right where it was. And, uh, you know, the, the guard that was kind of over us was like, don't do that. Just, like, leave it out. <laughs> you know, and we're supposed to just find contraband or whatever. Um, you know, so this was one of those times where I was like, okay, I am actually a guard. And I'm like, uh, there's only so much that I can kind of, yeah, I can, like, find some lunch meat they stole from the cafeteria and put it in the back but like you know um there's not a lot I can do but one one time that w that really was a pivotal moment for me was um we were searching the one of the tiers in the common area and I was just kind of doing this like perfunctory search uh and I went under a there's a water fountain and I reached under it and my hand landed on a phone a cell phone but the prisoners were there like there were prisoners standing around, and this is like the, my first week on the job. So one prisoner saw me there, 
you know, obviously he knew the phone was there. And so I had this kind of like moment where I was like, what do I do, you know? Um, and there was this kind of debate in my head. There was like the f former prisoner, you know, which is the person that I actually was. And then I was just in this kind of guard role. Um, and as a prisoner, I would have done anything to get a cell phone. And I would have never snitched on another prisoner taking a cell phone. Um, and I knew that if I left the phone, that guy would see me and that that would kind of ease my relationship with the prisoners because they would know that I didn't take it. But at the same time, when I started the job, I th think that this is normal for anybody starting the job, there's kind of like, you're getting pulled in two directions. You're, the prisoners are trying to get you to give allegiance to them and the administration is doing the same. And the administration is, is suspicious of every new guard. Like when I was in training, they, this instructor, one of the supervisors said, uh, you know, half of you are gonna be dirty. Um, so I knew that if I took the phone, it would alleviate that suspicion. They would know I was on their team, which would also help me not blow my cover. And it was my job, you know, and I had gone in with the intention that like, I needed, I'm gonna do this job the way it's supposed to be done, which, partially for the story, but also protected me um, legally in some ways. Uh, so I took the phone. And, uh, and um, I really had a hard time after that with, I mean, I felt guilty about it, but also like the prisoners hated me. So I really had to deal with that for a while. Hi. I just uh, returned last night from Mendota, California, where I was to visit my son. And after filling out all the paperwork and everything was okay, we got to the prison and he was told uh, two hours before that all visitations were canceled. Mm -hmm. So I had gone all that way uh, for naught. I was, my question to you was, did you have visiting um, regulations at Wynn? Um, I never worked in visitation, so I actually don't, know a lot about how that worked. I would send, you know, they would call the unit and say, like, send this person, and I would just send them off. But mm -hmm. that was really it. Yeah, okay. We were told it was because they were going to be doing uh, work on the water tower, not what that had to do mm -hmm. with yeah. prisoners. But but you're just, you're at that, to the mercy of them. Yeah. So we turned around and came home. Yeah, I mean, there would be times when uh, the prison was locked down uh, which meant that prisoners could not leave their dorms, they couldn't go to the cafeteria or right. visitation or anything. And sometimes that would be because there was like a big stabbing, but sometimes it's just because there weren't enough guards. Mm -hmm. There wasn't enough staff and they couldn't run the prison. Yeah. But I don't know what they told people to coming to visit. Right. You know. Thank you. We've got time for just one or two more. So how did it change you as a person to go undercover, undercover be a guard? I heard it so really tough job to do to be a guard yeah uh i mean at the time it changed me a lot while i was there uh i write about this a lot in the book this kind of evolution that i went through um and I, it got to the point where uh, my i did leave suddenly but i was um really debating whether to leave at that point um there was it was like when i was there i was uh I was hardly thinking about being a journalist anymore. I was just kind of obsessed with like, you know, the dynamics in the prison. Um, I don't know, I became like a, a lot more authoritarian and kind of, I had to, uh, I think pretty quickly, you know, I realized that um, to do the job, you know, at first I was trying to just do people favors and stuff like that. Um, and then there would be a couple of people that kind of like try to, you know, push me to do things that I did, couldn't do. And so I had to like set a line, and which everyone has to do in prison, whether you're a prisoner or a guard. And once you set a line, you have to hold it. Because if you don't, then like, you know, you're weak. Uh, which then put me into conflict with people. Um, and the first time I kind of like wrote somebody up, I felt really bad about it. And I was like, what's gonna happen to this guy? He's gonna get sent to segregation. And then pretty much, pretty shortly after that, I just kind of had to turn that off you know, and uh, turn off any kind of like guilt that I would have. And I think that's just, you have to do that to do that job, you know. And uh, I think I saw people 
uh, who came into the job that couldn't do that and they quit, you know. Um, but I think the people that stuck around inevitably would kind of turn off this kind of more humane or human part of them, at least while they were inside. So I was wondering, you know, if you listen to all of this, we read your book, we you watch documentaries about the 13th Amendment, and it makes you angry and you want to do something about it. In your opinion, what do you think is the best way to go about and really um, fight for prison reform? Is it simply writing and getting in touch with your Congress members and your senators? Is it looking through your mutual funds and divesting all of those funds and indices that carry shares of these private, private um, prison companies. What do you think, in your opinion, is the best way that we can fight um, for prison reform? Uh, I don't have the answer to that, to be honest. And I mean, I don't pretend to kind of, you know, um, be a journalist and like play all these roles. I mean, I try to be good at showing how terrible things are, but the solution, uh, there's a lot of people working on that stuff that uh, aren't me, but I know that there are, uh, I mean, there are tons of, of activist groups. I don't know what they are here, but I'm sure there are a lot of them. Um, there are, are groups on many college campuses that specifically focused on private prison divestment. Um, but, you know, the, the issue of private prisons is this is a symptom of a much, much bigger problem. You know, um, this is... Uh, a symptom of mass incarceration. You know, private prisons started because states couldn't build prisons fast enough, literally, and these companies stepped in and did it. Um, and, you know, so I focus on prisons in this book, but prisons are kind of the end of a problem, you know, and uh, there are so many components to this. There's policing, you know, uh, there's uh, prosecutorial power is a major issue. Um, uh, mandatory minimums is a major issue. Um, racism in American society is a major issue. Uh, economic inequality. I mean, all of these things end, like, take us to this problem. And we can ban private prisons, you know, and should. Um, but that's still just, like, one little piece. Um, but, you know, th th I don't think that's such a hard thing to imagine. I mean, it was not that long ago that the federal government did that. Um, and it was undone, but um, but I don't know. I would just try to find out what people are doing here, and I, and I don't know what they are. I'm not from here. Thanks to Shane Bauer for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>